Yo, what's up guys? I'm back and just wanted to apologize to you guys for the little bit of a delay in content as of late. Um, between going to Brazil for a family wedding as well as starting a new job as a founding engineer, um, I've been pretty pressed for time and still trying to get ramped up with the new job. So um, I'm finally feeling all caught up and I'll be back to providing more content to you guys. Today I wanted to go over a small concept of something that I learned at this new job. Clay, one of probably the most talented engineers that I've ever had a chance to work with, who came over from Facebook, has taught me quite a lot about GraphQL and I felt that that knowledge might be useful for you guys as well. The concept that I want to cover today is that of GraphQL fragments. Um, so let's get this project started and then later on when we actually start implementing some fragments we can discuss what they are. All right, so first thing I'm going to do is let's actually create this project. So we're just gonna go ahead and create a GraphQL fragments tutorial, just repository here, if I can spell tutorial. And then within here, we're going to then also create our server. So we're gonna start by setting up our server. Then we're just going to CD into server and just run a quick npm init y to just create this as a node project. And then we're going to add the two libraries that we're going to be using for the server, which are Apollo server and GraphQL. The server on the back end for this tutorial is going to be pretty simple. So it's not going to use too many complicated things. And we're just going to define some quick GraphQL types in it and a single resolver. And once that's done installing, we can then go in and let's just create our quick little index.js file and open up Visual Studio Code. And so here we go. As you can see, we have our package JSON with our two dependencies here. We also are going to go ahead and let's just add a start script. So that's just going to pretty much just run index.js. So that's just gonna be extremely simple. And then in index.js, I am going to go ahead and actually copy this and kind of walk through what this code actually is um, going to be doing for us on the server side. So I don't know if you guys heard that noise of someone trying to take a picture. So I'm pretty much using Logitech Capture and you can see here that they have all of these alt shortcuts for um, pretty much just binding different things. And the reason that you guys heard that is that I actually started using Power Toys and this is, has nothing to do with the tutorial, but um, Pretty much why I started using this is because I actually have been doing a lot of Mac programming and so I've gotten really used to the Mac keyboard shortcuts and on Windows it's kind of it's kind of a little jarring to keep switching between Mac and uh, Windows so I actually went through and remapped a bunch of shortcuts and so it seems that for some weird reason Logitech now is taking my alt shortcuts and starting to try to like use these in the background so I'm going to just turn these off really quick. All right, sorry about that. So let's get back to the tutorial. So here, as you can see, we actually have some pretty simple GraphQL code here. Um, if we go to the bottom, you can see that we're actually just instantiating a new Apollo server with the type definitions and resolvers that we define here above. If we look at the resolvers, you can see that it's pretty much just a single query of books, which is just going to return my hard coded value of books right here. And if we take a look at these books types, you can see that we just have like a simple ID. We're also going to have a title. And then we also have an author object embedded within the book. That's pretty much just saying the same thing, which the author has an ID, the author has a name, and the author also has an age. And then if we look at our type definitions, we also have just the type of book, which is just those three fields, and they're all required. We also have type of author, which is also all those three fields, which are also required. And then we're also just uh, instantiating our books query resolver right here, which is pretty much just going to return a list of books, which should be required as well. All right. And since we've got that instantiated, let's go back and actually create our client for the front end for GraphQL. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually just going to use um, create react app. So just yarn create react app client. And I'm going to be using the template for TypeScript. And once that's done, we can actually switch into our client repository and let's open it up and see what Create React App has done for us. So as we can see, Create React App has gone ahead and installed a bunch of dependencies for us, pretty much just anything to be used with React and TypeScript, which is really nice. It's also gone ahead and created some scripts for us. So that's great. And then it's just some browser list and some ESLint configuration things. And then let's see, then it's also gone ahead and created the app as well as the index and some simple styling. So let's actually test that everything has been installed correctly. And uh, the first way to do that is I can just run yarn start. 
on my client repository. And once that boots up, you can see that we should get that little spinning React logo. So that's good to go. And it seems that I've created these outside of the actual repository that I wanted to. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to quickly move those into the GraphQL fragments tutorial. So if I move that and let's also move client, I think this might actually not work because it's running. Uh, where is it running at? Oh, right here. So let's just kill you, go away. And then now let's go back and try that again. And so now if we actually go into the server and do yarn start, we should be able to see that this is ready to go. And so then if we navigate here to localhost 4000 slash GraphQL, we should see a Apollo sign here. So it looks like our server and our client are ready. And then first thing I wanna do for the client side is I actually wanna go ahead and start installing some libraries that will allow us to work with GraphQL. And the one that I'm gonna use for this simple uh, quick tutorial is just I'm gonna install GraphQL as well as GraphQL code in, go, code gen slash CLI and the Apollo client. I'm just gonna be using the Apollo client since it's pretty easy to spin up. And this is just more of a concept video as opposed to like a full on tutorial of how to set these kind of projects up. And once those have been installed, let's actually initialize GraphQL code gen by doing yarn code gen in it. And the option that we're going to choose is we're going to be doing an application built with React. Um, yep, that is the path. Let's just leave this for it as the default. Leave that as the default default. Um, we don't need an introspection file. Yep, just leave that as default. And then let's just name our script called generate. So this is actually gonna go through and install the selected plugins that we have um, selected in this step right here for this plugin step. And then also initialize a cogen.yaml. And let's actually take a look at what that has created for us. If we take a look at this cogen.yaml, you can see that we have this overwrite, meaning that every time that this script is run, just pretty much overwrite the previous um, generated file, meaning that it'll just right over it. I guess that's what overwrite means. Um, and then if we look at the schema, we just are pointing to localhost 4000, which is the URL for our backend. It's going to look through all of the documents under source and the end in dot GraphQL. We are going to change this here in a bit and I'll explain why. And then the generate step here is pretty much just saying like, Hey, where do we actually want to generate these outputs? And so we're going to be putting it into source generated GraphQL.txx. And the plugins that we're going to be using are TypeScript, TypeScript operations, as well as TypeScript React Apollo. And so let's just quickly overwrite this really quick. And it's not that big of a change. You'll notice here that once I paste this in, the biggest change that we've had is to this documents. And pretty much what I changed was I'm pretty much telling it, hey, um, instead of just looking at the dot GraphQL files, I'm actually wanting to generate um, these GraphQL code gen from also TypeScript files as well as TSX files. And um, the reason for that is because I'm actually kind of a supporter of including fragments where they um, need to be. And what I mean by that is like defining fragments within components of which they will be used. And um, you'll see why later on in the video, but that's pretty much just the change that we've made. So now that we'll actually be able to pick up in line or not in line, but like um, GraphQL that is defined within these TSX files that we're going to create. And then also I want to make sure that we also don't look into this generated GraphQL TSX since we are including TSX as part of this. Um, if we don't include this not here, it'll actually also look within the generated file to see whether or not we need to create some more um, GraphQL code gen and then things just end up breaking. And let's test out that this is working. So what I'm going to do is just within the app, I'm just going to go ahead and quickly just create a GQL. Um, and this should be why is this not asking me to import this? Do I not? Oh, okay, there we go. All right, and then let's just create a quick query. So just get books, and then this is just gonna be books, which is just gonna return ID and title. And then, so if we save that, and then we go to our client here, and we run, let's just make sure our server is running. And so it is running. So then if we run yarn generate, this should then go ahead and actually generate some files for us. And as you can see, it does not. And the reason for that is because we actually did not install our dependencies. So uh, GraphQL code gen in it actually just fetches those dependencies for you, but it doesn't actually install them for you. So this should work after we actually install the dependencies that were fetched for us. All right, and now that those have been installed, now if we were to do yarn generate, um, this should then go ahead and actually see it, it was able to generate those outputs. 
And so then if we go to the generated folder into the GraphQL, you can see that GraphQL Cogen has gone ahead and read from our server that we have a author type, we have the scalar types, we have the book type as well as our books query, and then also just um, some more documents and things like that that were just auto-generated from the um, query that we define, as well as some queries, uh, some use hooks that we could later on use to actually use that books query in the front end. And now that that is working, we can actually start setting up Apollo client. And it's actually really simple to uh, set up, which is kind of why the I chose to go down this route of using Apollo client. And uh, the way to do that is actually just to, first we have to just import a couple of things from the Apollo client library. So we're gonna import Apollo client, as well as Apollo provider and the in-memory cache. We then create this Apollo client object using this new Apollo client, which we then pass in the URI. So make sure that is a URI, not URL. And then the cache, which is just an, a new in-memory cache. And then all we gotta do is wrap our app in a Apollo provider with uh, supplying the client that we just created. And since now that we actually have these, uh, the, our app wrapped in Apollo provider, let's actually create some components that we can actually um, start fetching some data from our server. So what I'm gonna do in source is I'm just going to create a components folder. Within here, I'm just going to create a quick um, little info page dot scope.css and the reason I'm creating this simple CSS file is that I'm going to be using tables and so I just want to quickly um, just is define some quick little table CSS so that it's a little bit easier to see um, on the front end and then after creating that we're also going to then create the info page.tsx and I'm just going to copy this from here and paste it and then we can walk over what this code is um, actually doing so uh, as you can see this info page is pretty much just importing that simple um, table styles that I just created. We're also defining our GQL within the TSX, um, which is pretty much what I meant by let's actually uh, update our CodeGen YAML to look for documents that also include TSX. That way that if we do define um, GraphQL within a component like this, it will actually get picked up by CodeGen and generate what we want. So I pretty much moved that get books query into info page. And if I do that, then that means I could probably remove this. So we can just make it so that app just pretty much is that for now. And then if we go back to info page, you can see here that we are actually calling that use get books query from that was generated for us by GraphQL CodeGen. And then um, pretty much then we have uh, just a quick little check like let's make sure that the data being returned is actually not null as well as that it's not actually still fetching the data if it is we just return a quick little loading component or little fragment there and then down here we're actually going to define a table and this table is just going to include um, id and title and then here also needs to include name so this will actually be the author name and then um, if you take a look at here you can see that we are actually getting some TypeScript support of actually what these types are. Since we have those types defined in the CoGen, it knows that data.books should return this type of book of ID and title. But as you can see, author is not included. And the reason for that is because since we've updated this code and we've updated this query, right now we don't have a way to automatically update GraphQL CoGen. Um, there are multiple ways to actually do this, but um, for this tutorial, I'm not gonna go too deep because it takes a little bit of a, some time to set that up. But pretty much all we gotta do is just run yarn generate again. So what this will do is it'll actually look through our uh, source files again, see what all the queries and all the different things that have been updated, and then actually uh, manually update those for us. So now if you can look through this book.author actually exists because if we go to the generated file, you can see that get books now actually returns author name, which previously it only returned ID and title. And the last thing we gotta do to make sure that this is actually working is let's just update our um, app here so that instead of actually using this, let's just make it use that info page that we have defined. We can get rid of this. Let's move this below that since we just want CSS to be the last thing. And so now if we were to go and let's make sure these are running. So this, if we start up our client, and the server is still running, we should then now see that info page, which should just display a table with the ID, the title, and the author's name. And as you can see, that is exactly what we got. 
And now before we actually go any further in the programming part of this tutorial, let's actually start discussing what are GraphQL fragments. And GraphQL fragments you can think of are pretty much just a piece of logic that can be shared between multiple queries. Um, and let me actually make this a little bit bigger. And as you can see, I pretty much took that definition straight up from their website. So GraphQL fragment is a piece of logic that can be shared between multiple queries and mutations. So you can pretty much define, for example, first name, last name, fragment on the person type, meaning that anytime you are actually fetching a per, uh, object of the person type, you can then actually include this name parts fragment like this. And it'll actually know to include these two subset of fields for you, which is really nice. It's really nice for reusability, uh, readability, and it just kind of makes your code a lot cleaner. To take that an even step further, the way that I like to use it and that they kind of also touch a little bit upon here, which is something that I wasn't too familiar with until Clay brought it up at work during one of our pull request reviews, is that you can actually define co-locating fragments, which means that since your front end framework like React is pretty tree-like in structure, meaning that you have parent components with child components and subcomponents, what you can actually do is that you can define these fragments within the components that they need to be used. And that way you actually never give a component more data than it actually needs through if you're passing um, objects as props. So I don't really like the way that they've kind of gone ahead and like name some of these fragments. So I'm not going to go too in depth in their uh, documentation with this, but I think the best way to kind of show you guys what I'm talking about is just to give you guys an example and walk through it with you. So let's go back to our code. And for a good example to show you guys, I'm going to create a couple of subcomponents that then we will define uh, the fragments that each component needs and show you guys how that all works with uh, passing in props to those components. So first component I'm going to create is let's just create a simple books table. So I'm just going to do books table .tsx and just copy this over here and, and walk through it with you guys. If we take a quick look at this books table component here, you can see we actually define a fragment and this naming convention is actually extremely important and very useful. Um, it's very similar to React Relay's fragment naming convention if you're familiar with React Relay at all. But pretty much what it does is you define the first part of the fragment name to be the actual name of the component. So for example, since we are in the books table component, we will be naming this books table and then underscore and then the type of which this fragment is on. So as you can see, this is a fragment on the type book. So we just name it uh, underscore book. And the reason for this, again, you can make this any kind of naming convention you want, but I find this extremely useful because it helps me at least remember um, up on the, like as we go to the parents and whatnot, whenever we use these fragments, I can just remember like, oh, I remember I need the fragment from the books table component. So, and it's on the book type. So it's very easy to remember instead of having to come back to this component and then um, grabbing the name and then using it that way. And then the cool thing about these fragments is that as you can see here, the props that we're passing in are still books of the type book, but we're actually just making the actual fragment type as opposed to the, um, the entire book object. So that way, this component, for example, is only interested in the books as well as the ID and the title, meaning that the fragment, we're only interested in the ID and the title. So then the information that this component ever receives from its parent components or is only contains the information and the data that it actually needs, which is great because I feel like that's kind of like the entire mantra behind GraphQL is like fetch only the data that you need, right? So um, as you can see, it's still a little complaining a little bit. So let's just quickly go back to our terminal here. And the reason for that is because we haven't run yarn generate. So if I run yarn generate, oh, and one more thing, we actually need to put this component to use or this fragment to use. So that'll clean up our books table error. But if we go to info page, you can see that our books query is still using the old one. And so what I want to do is actually to use a fragment on a query or of a certain type or an object, what you can do is just the dot, dot, dot spread operator and then the actual name of the fragment. And if we go back to our terminal here and run yarn generate again, you can see now that that query type in the GraphQL um, generated file for us will actually include that fragment as well. So you can see here, here's our git books query. And now you can see that our um, fragment is actually being used. And this kind of syntax down here is actually just the GraphQL code gen, um, making sure that that fragment document is included in the query. 
And last thing to do is just make sure that this is all working correctly. And what we're gonna do is just take this books table component that we just created and let's actually modify our info page so that now instead of actually um, just displaying the table in here, we're just pretty much all doing the same stuff. We still got our same query here. We're going to then just actually render that books table. And you can see that we can actually pass in data.books even though data.books in this case also includes authors. So the um, component is smart enough to know that like, hey, uh, this is a subset of this overall query result and it only gives the component the information that it needs. So let's go back to our client terminal here and let's just run yarn start, um, get a little bit of warnings. But then if we see here, now we should get the books list, which has the ID and the title. And to further solidify this kind of idea of the subcomponents kind of requesting the and defining the fragments and getting the information that it needs, I'm going to also create another component called authors table, which will be similar to the books table. But instead, I, I think you guys can guess of what this is going to be about. Um, instead of being about books, it's going to be actually about authors. So you can see here we have our fragment, which is the same naming convention, authors table, which is the name of the component the type of which the object this fragment is gonna be acted upon, so on author. And we're just gonna get the ID, the name, and the age. Another thing to know as well, as you can see that I always return underscore ID, even though in the books table um, fragment, I define it here as well. And that's just kind of like one of the things that I picked up is that sometimes um, caching is a little weird if you define the, frag the underscore ID in the fragment and not in the actual, uh, query. So one of the best practices that I've seen people do is that just make sure you always include underscore ID or ID, whatever the value that you're actually caching these objects in. And back to the authors table, you can see that it's very similar to the books table, but instead now we're actually passing in authors, we can pass in this authors table author fragment type as an array, we're going to get the authors and then we're going to pretty much do the exact same thing that we were doing with tables, but instead with the authors object that we return from the get books query. And to actually make sure that that is working, we can go back to info page. Here, we're going to update our query. So now you can see that we can actually update the author um, return value to actually include that fragment for that author's table author. And then we can actually also render the author's table um, down here in the info page. This should be complaining because we haven't um, actually run yarn generate. So let's just kill this run yarn generate so that we can actually generate that author's table fragment type and it seems like there is a little bit of an issue books table books this actually needs to be books table underscore book since we um, changed the name of it to be singular since the type of the object is book and there we go so now if we run yarn start we can then see that this should show up with the books list and then we also have the author's table. Sweet. And now let's actually change this. So this, not, this isn't a list anymore. Let's make this just a books table. Um, the last component that I wanna to create to show you guys is a component that actually kind of takes both of these types and combines them into one. So what I'm gonna create is a component called the book author list.tsx. And within this component, we're actually going to define a little bit more of a complicated fragment where this fragment is still on the book type. Since if we go to our backend, um, let me actually open that up really quick. If we look at our server type definitions, you can see that author is actually just a subtype or pretty much like an embedded schema of the book type. So now if we go back to our client, what we can do is that since it is, we know that that is an embedded value, you can actually create similar um, fragments with just on the book type itself. So what we want to do for this component is, is, again, as you can see, naming convention, book author list underscore book on book. And we're just going to define we want the ID, we want the title, we want the author's ID and the name. And then again, similar style to the other places, we have this props where we actually pass in books, where we pass in the fragment, meaning that this component will never get more information than it actually needs. And then we're just going to render a quick list, pretty much just saying like, hey, this book was written by this guy. Um, and so we are then going to go back to the info page. Before I do that, I actually need to, um, no, actually, let's go back to the info page. Let's make sure we actually render this. 
And then um, again, with the quick changes that uh, you can see here, I actually include the fragment and then I actually uh, render the component. But one thing we gotta do to make sure is that since we haven't set up auto regen for code gen, let's just do yarn generate. So this will go ahead and actually give us those fragment types in GraphQ in our TypeScript files. And then, so now we can then run yarn start. And if we go back and there's just a bunch of these guys open now, let's just close all of these other guys. And now you can see we have all of our components being rendered as they should be. So we have our books table, which only has books information, authors table, which only has the authors information. And then we also have a combined component here that has both the book title as well as the author name. And as you can see, like this is a very simple example as we are only having like, for example, an info page with three uh, first level child components, but you can see how this might become really useful if the deeper you go down the tree. For example, if the uh, the books table has a books modal or something like that, you can then start defining um, different fragments in these different components. And then instead of actually having to come back here and actually change what fragment is being used at the highest level, you only need to go and start percolating it back up. So for example, if you have a hook or a modal in the books table component, you can define a fragment for what that hook or that modal with the information that it needs. And then you go into the books table here itself and then this component. And then you might have a, another type here where you could just do like something like dot, 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 books, modal underscore book, right? And so then that would include the fragment from the subcomponent in this component, which then will also be included in the parent info page component. And so you can see how that kind of, um, follows a similar structure as to how like a tree like structure of how like most front end frameworks um, are built nowadays. And yeah, so that's pretty much all I've got for you guys. I just wanted to make a quick little tutorial video about something that I've learned at work that I found really useful and kind of changed the entire way that I design um, GraphQL front ends. Um, and so I thought you guys might be interested in learning about that as well. So appreciate Clay for um, walking me through that as well as explaining um, all of these concepts to me as well. Um, but yeah, I'm happy to be back. I'm glad that um, I get to create some more content and that I finally feel ramped up with my job as well as like everything else that's going on in my life. So um, look forward to more programming content for me. And if you enjoyed this video, um, please be sure to like and subscribe as well. And I'll see you guys in the next one. Thanks.